I, and I even call up those people who are cameras and say, look, just been specific. use their uh, mics and um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, let's go ahead and get started. On behalf of the University of Tulsa, um, School of Nursing, I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining us this evening for our highly anticipated and very special event. My name is Dr. Bill Buron. I am the director of the TU School of Nursing and will serve as the moderator for our event this evening. I would like to begin by sharing some information about the nursing program here at TU. During my time as director of the program, I have been impressed with so many of the attributes that make TU nursing program so special and unique. I would like to share some of these highlights with you this evening. TU nursing has a strong history, graduating our first class in 1973. Since the 1970s, TU nursing has built an outstanding undergraduate curriculum. Most nursing programs provide a disease-based curriculum based on the medical model. Throughout our history, we have offered an integrated concept-based curriculum, a true nursing model curriculum, an ideal nursing curriculum that many universities are trying to convert to. This is a very difficult switch with some experiencing challenges along the way. We have an outstanding faculty. Approximately 70% of our full-time faculty hold doctorates in nursing, and they are very specialized in what they teach. The university supports small class sizes with personalized teaching. Faculty know, support, and respect all students as individuals. Again, very important to the School of Nursing, Oxley College of Health Sciences, and the University of Tulsa. We offer DNP programs with specializations as a family nurse practitioner, adult gerontology, adult gerontology acute care nurse practitioner, postmasters, and a brand new nurse anesthesia program. The one and only nurse anesthesia program in the state of Oklahoma. We just admitted our first class of 16. And I'm very excited to report that we have an unofficial 2020 96% first time NCLEX RN licensure pass rate well above the average pass rate for all types of nursing programs in the state of Oklahoma and nationally. And we have 100% licensure pass rate in our graduate NP programs since inception. We have a state-of-the-art Lawson Family Nursing Simulation Center and Skills Lab at our newly renovated building in downtown Tulsa. I could go on and on, but I will summarize by noting that TU offers extraordinary high quality nursing education programs at the BSN and DNP levels. Our graduates are outstanding pr practitioners and leaders in healthcare organizations throughout Tulsa and beyond. I'm happy to report that approximately 40 of our alumni have joined us here this evening. A very special welcome to each of you. This is an especially important evening as we are joined by many people from a wide variety of backgrounds, all who provide strong support to our TU nursing programs. We are joined by our acting provost, Dr. Tracy Manley, the Dean of the Oxley College of Health Sciences, Robin Ploger, a representative of the Oxley Foundation, Connie Bolter. We greatly appreciate the Oxley Foundation's generous support of our college and healthcare programs over the years. Current undergraduate and graduate nursing students, our faculty, staff, our esteemed retired faculty, alumni, friends of the program, including donors and hospital administrators, and approximately 10 prospective undergraduate nursing students. We are excited for the opportunity to welcome you into our TU nursing family very soon. So why is this event so special this evening? This evening we'll be hearing from a highly esteemed internationally known nurse who developed a well-known nursing theory that forms the basis of our entire undergraduate nursing program. As many of you know, we incorporated Sister Calista Roy's adaptation model as the theoretical framework for our BSN program for many years. Sister recently informed me that TU was one of the first nursing programs to adopt her framework. That was in the mid 1970s. Since then, we have educated over 1400 nurses who were immersed in learning and applying her theory to practice the art and science of nursing throughout their education and longstanding careers. Her wonderful theoretical nursing framework combined with our outstanding curriculum have truly stood the test of time. As a side note, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to request that you submit any and all questions via chat during the presentation and during the question and answer session. I will field those questions later during our question and answer session. Now I would like to provide a little more information about our speaker this evening. Sister Calista Roy 
a Catholic nun, nursing theorist, professor and author, was born October 14th, 1939. She is a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. She graduated from Mount St. Mary's College with a bachelor's degree in nursing in 1963. She graduated with her master's degree in pediatric nursing from UCLA in 1966. She went on to obtain her master's and doctorate in sociology from UCLA in 1977 and later did postdoctoral research at the University of California at San Francisco from 1983 to 1985. She became a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing in 1978. In 2007, she was designated a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. In 2010, she became an inductee of Sigma Theta Tau's Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame. She is most notable for her work on developing the Roy Adaptation Model, which was introduced in the 1970s and adopted by the TU Nursing Program shortly after that. Her model is used internationally. She has over 100 publications and has written 11 books. She is a major speaker throughout the United States and 36 under other countries on topics ranging from nursing theory to clinical practice to trends in nursing. She was a professor and nursing theorist at Boston College for many years before retiring in 2017. At that time, she moved back to Los Angeles, California to reside in the local community of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. She continues as a professor emeritus at Mount St. Mary's College in Los Angeles, California. Having visited our nursing program many years ago, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome back Sister Callista Roy. Thank you, Bill. It is a joy and a privilege to speak to so many faculty, students, administration, alum, and all the friends of the University of Tulsa this, e Tulsa. this evening, I'm going to be focusing on the Roy Adaptation Model and primarily its development and uses. I'll begin my story by talking about the influences that I had as a student and a theorist. For all of you, uh, you have people who in your lives and in many ways helped you. And I will say a little bit about these, uh, certainly my family, uh, my education, my religious background, my teachers and my mentors were all important. So here's a picture of my family. Now this is not all of us yet, but I wanted to show it because my mother was a licensed vocational nurse and she's in her uniform there and I'm in the back row between my two brothers. And then later, this is the family with just my seven sisters and seven brothers at Sister. my parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Sister, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, we're not seeing your slides. Oh my goodness. Oh shoot. Okay, let's, uh, oh, I'm very sorry. Okay. Okay, now, okay. I don't know if you have a share screen there at the bottom. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, at, yeah, you know what? I think I have to close it to be able to get all the options up there. Ugh, sorry. But the good thing is everyone should have your slides. <laughs> yeah, I understand, but this, the, it'll be much yeah. easier for me to talk and it will, we can yeah. do this. I just have to, I, like I said, I have to, I'll end the show. Yeah, now I've got all the buttons at the bottom I can work with, okay.
Sister, if you'd like, I can I could share the your slides on the screen and you could just tell me to next slide. Okay. Okay, okay. I think I think I don't want to waste more time. So let's yeah, let's do it that way. Okay, fine. Uh, so I'll have mine in front of me and uh, Okay, so I was greeting all of you and letting you know that uh, As I tell the story, I want to be able on the second slide. I have all the influences in my life. And then I had just barely uh, put up the slide of my mother uh, with a uh, her uh, nursing uniform. And in that particular uh, slide, I'm in the back row uh, with between two of my brothers. And eventually, we were seven girls and seven boys. So this is all of us, just my siblings, at my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, being the second oldest in a large family, uh, I learned a lot about responsibility. Uh, at the same time, my people were, particularly my parents, of great, great faith. And so always trusting in God was an important part of my life. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is a celebration for my dad's 90th birthday a number of years ago with uh, showing more of our family as it at grew and families had families. So family has always been very important to me. The other uh, place that has always been important to me is Mount St. Mary's University, Los Angeles. When I went here, it was a college. It's a women's college in West Los Angeles on a beautiful campus, has a second campus that's equally beautiful in the downtown area, primarily for leadership, women's leadership. And the nursing department here is very large. It actually was the first baccalaureate program in California. And I became a bachelor's uh, prepared nurse here. I got a BA because I had plenty of liberal arts education for which I've always been very, very grateful. So in my student days, next slide, I enjoyed all clinical areas, but especially pediatrics. And uh, I had, because of Los Angeles is very large and I had wonderful learning experiences at many, many teaching hospitals. And I even, I wanna tell a story about uh, uh, being a critical thinker uh, even as I was a junior nursing student in pediatrics, because one day I was taking some notes and my faculty came in and said, what are you writing there? I said, oh, I'm writing down the child's behavior before the mother visits and after the mother visits. So already my mind was into developing knowledge for nursing. Uh, next. Uh, and the other thing that was a huge advantage for me at that time, my community was running five hospitals in the Western states. So every time I wasn't in school, I was at one of our hospitals. One was in the local area, Mister. but others were out of state. Uh, and so I uh, got to spend every summer uh, working in a hospital, et cetera. So I had great, great clinical experiences. Sister, I'm sorry now, to interrupt you again. Yes. Your slides aren't advancing. James, can you can you fix that? Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm I'm the one advancing the slides, and right now it's on student days. It, okay. I'm getting some messages from people. It's not coming through. Oh. And I'm not seeing it. I'm still seeing just um, the slide sorter on the left and the first slide showing on the screen. Oh. Uh. Or shall we take time and see if I can get mine uh, up for you? There we go. Now we're seeing the main slide there. Okay. Okay. So I, uh, just to review, I started with some of the influences uh, as, a, as a student and a theorist and just went through a little bit about my family background, slides three and four and five. And then about the importance of Mount St. Mary's, which uh, I got my bachelor's degree uh, and it will come up again uh, in the stories. And uh, 
the beginning of my student days here uh, and loving every clinical area of nursing. And then on slide eight, summer assignments in the hospitals of the Sisters of St. Joseph, because we had five in the Western States. Now, this is perfect because here we're going to start with the model. So the next slide is how and why develop a model. Well, I was very fortunate uh, that early on in my career within, uh, with some clinical experience, then I went to, uh, my community asked me to study at the University of California, Los Angeles to get a master's degree. And Dorothy E. Johnson was the, one of the, my teachers there. And she was a person who uh, early on uh, knew that nursing, particularly at the, this time in the 70s, moving quickly into higher education, just like moving into the University of Tulsa and other baccalaureate programs. Uh, she said, we have to have a clear knowledge base that is based on the goal of nursing to direct nursing education, practice and research. So her master's assignment was to describe the goal of nursing. She asked us in class, well, I had read something about adaptation. I thought, wow, that's a great idea for nursing. It really, uh, and so just as bold as anything, oh, I know what the goal of nursing is, it's to promote adaptation. So she said, what do you mean by that? That began my lifelong journey then, you see on slide 10, where I spent the whole time from a simple road to a very complicated road to describe and explain people and groups as adaptive systems. And the next slide shows me with Dorothy Johnson. Uh, I don't know the date of this, but uh, she, uh, in any case, we're at some meetings and we're the two in the middle. I'm the younger, obviously. And then, uh, but she was hugely important in my life and really encouraged me. So our assignments then, the first semester was a term paper on nursing as promoting adaptation. As you can imagine, uh, during any time, you're a young master's student, and the one thing, I, what I didn't have, a good definition of adaptation. Well, I knew, for goodness sakes, I was not going to be able to turn in a decent term paper if I couldn't find a definition. So at UCLA, they had, um, an undergraduate library. They had a research library as well, but I went to the undergraduate library in the basement. There was an old card catalog and I just looked under A, adaptation. And the new book had just come in, Adaptation Level Theory by Helson. Well, so that was hugely important to me. Uh, Helson was a physiological psychologist but his ideas gave me what I needed to be able to develop the concept of adaptation for nursing. And then second semester, our term paper was on how to design and test interventions based on adaptation. So you see, I got a really running start here. So in the early development, I would say the 1960s to the 1970s, uh, I came to Mount St. Mary's very young to teach. I did have some more clinical in between, but um, through uh, the faculty were interested in developing a more nursing based curriculum. This is in the 60s, so it was very early for them. And I started talking about the model. Well, 12 of the 14 had taught me a couple of years before, they didn't care too much. However, the next, I got a strange thing happened. Again, the providence of God, I, I ended up being in bed for a year and with a terrible uh, vertigo, I came back and they said, now, what were you saying a year ago about adaptation? We haven't, we've been spinning our wheels. And so that then is how the, we, we decided to develop it 
we remember we had no books, but we had binders of all the concepts being developed. So uh, it, it, I could spend more time on that story, but I do want to move forward. So the concepts of the model then, um, So the first persons, persons are, a, I'm on slide 14, adaptive systems, and they have four adaptive modes with processes for adaptation. And they also have internal coping uh, processes. Now, the way I came up with uh, these was uh, I had the students collect samples of patient behavior for me. They had little, little cards, you know, two by uh, five, and they wrote on them when the patient needed a nurse, describe what's going on. And then I sat in what we would call today concept analysis, uh, content analysis. I mean, we, I sorted them and physiologic wasn't hard to get there, but then I spent some time uh, trying to read and label the others but they were extremely helpful. And we found over the years, they have remained so. Next, so the physiological adaptive mode, as many of you know, and some of you are new to this, uh, includes later, I was able to divide it into the basic needs, oxygenation, nutrition, elimination, activity and rest and protection. And then, but then there are more complicated processes. So the senses, fluid and electrolytes, neurologic function and endocrine function. The self-concept mode uh, involves the need for psychic and spiritual integrity. And it is uh, a composite of the beliefs and feelings that one holds about oneself at a given time formed from internal perceptions. My own, you know, when I'm teaching in a room and I have to pull, used to have to pull the screen down, I'm not a very big person. So when I have to stand on my tiptoes, I, I perceive I am short. And from other people's uh, reactions to me. So a person builds their self-concept both internally and from other people's perceptions. Role function mode is the, the underlying need is social integrity. So it's the need to know who one is in relation to others so that one can act appropriately. An example I've often used is if you go to a new clinical agency and you go to the cafeteria and someone says, oh, that's the vice president for nursing over there. And then, but Knowing her role is one thing, but you've got to also know how to act. And they'd say, we never call her by her first name, or we always. So the idea of role function has to give you enough information to act. The interdependence mode then, the underlying need is relational integrity. Now this mode took us a little longer to straighten out, but it really, uh, some people thought it might be mixed up with role, but no, it is a separate idea. It focuses on the interactions related to giving and receiving love, respect, and value. And it involves our significant others and support systems. So put it all back together, slide 21, where we have a human systems of adaptation. Now I haven't talked about it yet, but uh, so you have the four modes interlocking. And in this diagram, it's both at the group and individual level. So physiologic, physical, self-concept, group identity, role function and interdependence. And the coping processes are what's going on, but you have the environment, both internal and external coming in. And then the behavior is what happens after when the person processes it. And so to say more about environment then, uh, it has to do with the, because of Helson's work, I was able to describe three different types of stimuli. Focal, the one most immediately affecting the person, the pain right now, uh, 
the contextual, everything that uh, makes, affects how that focal stimuli affects them and residual, some other background things we might not know. Uh, and an example I use is I remember a patient saying, uh, you know, I can take a lot of pain, except if it's in my stomach, because my mother died of stomach cancer. So focal is pain, context is her memory about her mother. So the body gives us a much better way to look at the environment in general. And then later I've developed ideas about this at the group level with a whole global and cosmic perspective. Health then uh, is the being and becoming whole and integrated, which requires coping with the changing environment, whether you're getting well or trying to prevent illness, uh, this is what's going on. And it can be assessed. Later, we were able to develop these levels, integrated, compensatory, or compromised adaptation levels. Nursing then focuses on the goal to promote adaptation for individuals and groups. It uses the nursing process and is based on philosophical assumptions. So the adaptive modes as the basis for understanding those modes becomes the basis for us to make our clinical assessments and interventions and also helps us provide scientific knowledge for uh, practice. We develop more knowledge. So I want to give just one quick clinical example of the use of knowledge. The family in the community, an elderly couple at home. So uh, a diagnosis uh, for Mrs. Escobar is her commitment to at-home care for a mentally impaired husband, maybe the early signs of Alzheimer, related to her, so, so that's her behavior, her commitment, and, and then related to is the stimuli, deep affection for him, confidence in her own abilities, and assistance provided by significant others. But if you look at it from the uh, husband's point of view, Mr. Escobar, his behavior is increased agitation, restlessness, and risk of a mishap uh, due to the environment that does not provide freedom or security. So, uh, and a different diagnosis for uh, the wife, Mrs. Escobar, fatigue and exhaustion due to sleep disturbances of the husband and concern about ability to cope with the decreasing functional abilities related to a lack of knowledge about effective approaches and actions to support a mentally impaired individual. So the nurse, after to gather with the family, would be able to set goals that within one week, Mr. E will demonstrate uh, fewer episodes of aggression. Within one month, Mrs. E and her family will express an increased sense of security and support as they care for him. And then all of this would take place following the enhancement of the home environment uh, that will have happened and will confirm an enhanced quality of life for the family. So there's a lot more could be said about that, but it's just a quick example to give you an idea how to use it. So the planning of nursing interventions, you ask yourself, uh, what behaviors are the focus of the goal? What stimuli can the nurse change that will affect the behavior? And then what processes can be helpful? What strategies can be enhanced to strengthen coping and adaptation uh, processing? Now, as the model has developed over time, uh, the middle range theory and measurement of coping has become very important. So I wanna say a few words about this. We're searching for the commonalities that nurses can use to support coping. So I have some, common, some uh, possible coping strategies here. 
but I really want to tell a little more about this story. We started out with 72 items from several of my qualitative and quantitative studies, uh, items that were coping. Through factor analysis, we got it down to 29 items, and then it was used rather widely. And so we had several comparable samples of people uh, in different countries. So then I was able to get an expert on item response theory to, uh, to develop it with just 15 items, which cover everything. And uh, so it's called the coping and adaptation scale short form. And it's now already, so it's now already been used on six continents and uh, 21 countries. And it was just amazing how that became so helpful. It is translated into uh, many, many languages. Uh, it was published in 2016 in Applied Nursing Research. But in general, the intervention that I'm talking about here is the nurse coaches the patient in which situation to use one and when to use another. Like what is their best coping strategy? Will it work here? Or will you coach them to use another one? Uh, and what new strategies can they learn? So as we're looking at the nursing process, uh, coping is very important. And so therefore we've spent a lot of time working on that. To summarize, uh, thinking about theory in general, I say it acts as a global positioning system. It focuses our efforts in nursing. It guides development of knowledge and the discipline, and it responds to the health needs in society. So in the middle years, that was uh, how it was developed. From the 1980s to the mid 1990s, there was a great deal of theory development going on in general in nursing a great expansion in education. Then also in my own work, well, this, this is what was going on in my work, which was paralleling what was going on in nursing. I also did postdoctoral work in neuroscience nursing and an increasing literature on the model. And I was faculty uh, at Boston College. I did a great deal of speaking in the US and internationally in those years. So this is a picture of a group of theorists. I'm just gonna show a couple of these. The back, uh, Dorothy Johnson, Dorothea Oram, Betty uh, Newman, uh, Martha Rogers, Rosemary Parsi, and myself. Uh, some of the same people, except in the front, we also have Hildegard Peplow to the left and Imogene King to the right. And that's myself with Virginia Henderson. And this is an important picture because it's the last time it was taken at an academy meeting a few years ago. But since then, all but two, two of these people have died. So this was uh, Bet, uh, Margaret Newman. There's Parsi, King, Roy. Uh, uh, Watson is on the end and uh, imaging, uh, excuse me, Leininger is the one. But I've, uh, in any case, uh, people who really made an impact on nursing. So the years as a professor and nurse theorist at Boston College, the Cannell School of Nursing were hugely important. It's a lovely campus also, and uh, a great a Jesuit university. But uh, we had a faculty scholarship group there on philosophy, knowledge development, ethics, and spirituality. So it was great. And then at the same time, I joined a group called the Faith and Science Exchange, people of different religious faiths who also worked in uh, science. Uh, and so all of this was very influential. But what was most important is I was teaching uh, we opened a new PhD program. I was originally the consultant and then ended up on the faculty. So it's those uh, students and alums that have just been hugely important in my work. And then this shows just uh, graduate education and research across time and countries. And I only used one continent, but in any case, um, just gives you a broad image of, of how the work was going on. And uh, in 
slide 41, here I'm in Peru. And, but it was the conference that they gave. It had 856 nurses from 10 different Latin American countries. It happened to be in two, uh, 2011. But the work, as I said, uh, just a sample, sorry. I moved ahead an extra slide. Now, this is the title slide for the last section. So for the later years, 1995 to the present, uh, I've done the assumptions for the 21st century and adaptation redefined. We also developed a uh, large uh, eight knowledge development conferences that were based on a number of theories. Uh, then the Roy Adaptation Association was established. The major book revisions were done in, nine, in 1999 and 2008. Uh, I had a program of research then on the cognator that was all the coping abilities and the cognitive processing. And then we began research reviews. Uh, one of our members of the Roy Association said, oh, let's look at the literature. And we've done it in 25-year uh, increments, 15 years. And we've published two volumes of those. And we're doing the next set now. So there's a great deal of, of literature on it. Uh, and this is reviewing other people's research. So the philosophical basis, uh, then, I uh, call verativity. It had to do with me trying to find something the opposite of relativity. And it comes from the Latin word varitas, meaning truth, that is one. So its characteristics are that it is a common purposefulness. So all of creation is create in my, my vision. You don't have to have my religious vision, but a common purposefulness you could see in a lot of things. But it is uh, created by God and returning to God. There's a certain unity in all of creation, but also a huge diversity. And then each individual thing, whether it's a little flower or a person, has its own inner self-identity. So uh, this then is only my research. Uh, it's a synthesis, and I don't remember which year this was done, but a couple of years ago. So the theory of the cognitor then was able to give me both the middle range theory of cognitive processing. And then on the side, we could get the integrated reviews and we began testing propositions within those. And then our theory in coping in the four adaptive modes, middle range theories, uh, coping with the, with the instrument and some of the examples of that. But just systematically, we have been doing uh, research as well. So. This was then, as I said, the product of this uh, idea. And it was Susan Pollock on the picture on the bottom, the blonde hair to your left is the one who had the idea. Uh, I used to call her the co-founder co of the Roy Association, but no, it was all her idea. So she said, now you have people who've done work. Anyway, we began to get together and that was the beginning of it. So our idea was that we would identify, describe, and critically analyze the research based on the model. And we developed all the criteria for the analysis, the synthesis, and the critique, and its application to practice. So that was the first uh, uh, book of the research. The next, uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, across the years at five-year intervals, the research in it starts out pretty much 1975 is where we get the first ones. We have a great peak at 98 through 94. And the last one that's entered here is uh, 05 to 2010. So, but at that database was uh, 300 and it's only grown sig really significantly since then. But eh, so, uh, from the second book, we were able to generate middle range theory 
from evidence-based practice. Uh, that was the 15-year review. And there we reviewed and analyzed about 200 studies as data for knowledge development. So the middle range theories uh, in that book are coping, adapting to life events, adapting to loss, and to chronic health conditions, and to traumatic events, and family health. And this then gave us a way to use evidence-based practice redefined in the exemplars of levels of readiness for practice from all based on the research. So within our model, we have our own uh, system of knowledge and our own evidence-based practice. We also, uh, someone says, oh no, they've given up theories, but I had uh, a, a student, Johnson, who did this survey and it was uh, 2009. That's when people were saying they were giving it up. But as a matter of fact, uh, she found quite a bit of evidence for the use of models. In other words, 445 out of 1,003. I was amazed at how many people responded to her too. So associate degree, uh, they're color-coded. Uh, bacal uh, baccalaureate, associate is the brightest one, orange. Baccalaureate is the medium orange, masters and doctoral. So those are the how they responded. and. Uh, and as I said, amazingly, using theories to a much greater extent than people realized. Uh, and this also was uh, the another slide showing the use of the theories in, in basic education programs. And um, I think we don't have time to go, uh, but are you using one now? You know, it depends on the faculty, et cetera. But, but it, again, it was such a large number, it was amazing. And uh, in master's education, uh, very few had none at all, which I was quite, it was interesting. So the primary nursing theories used uh, here, uh, they're color coded. The Roy is the bright orange, uh, Newman, uh, Betty Newman uh, is the next orange, at Orem is the green and then other. So uh, 193 different programs. And by then, I think there were about, you know, 200 and some programs. So it's quite, it was quite a large number. And masters, like I said, most, uh, I, although the whole program wouldn't be based on them, but people would study theories. So uh, as we're getting to the end here, I just want to summarize uh, some of the strengths of using uh, the Roy adaptation model. Uh, it is very widely used in the US and worldwide. Actually, I'm quite amazed. <laughs> uh, literature is in all clinical specialties. The teaching practice materials is readily available. We have all this analysis of the research studies and there are networks uh, for education, uh, practice and uh, research. The international work, uh, North America, South America, you can see uh, Europe, Asia, Australia. And now if you talk about virtual, you know, it's, I, I, that's not on this slide, but I could add more continents and uh, more uh, countries as well. But let me just summarize that, um, Knowledge uh, for practice relates to having a philosophy, which then builds into a theory, which also is based on research. So I see this as, you know, the the bridge uh, from uh, from theory to practice uh, is really important. So, uh, in conclusion, I love this slide. This is actually a vision of the Earth as taken from the moon. So it's a new way to look at things. And you can think about uh, turning your mind toward a theoretical way of looking at nursing, if it's one particular theory, uh, as a new vision, Earth rising as seen from the moon. So my friends, that is uh, the end of my presentation. And I'd be thrilled to take uh, questions which I think I can get Bill up here and he's going to field questions for us. Yes, 
Thank you, Sister Clister Roy. Let me um, pull up the chat here. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the first question. And what were some of the greatest challenges you had in developing your theory over the years? Uh, well, uh, some were intellectual. You know, what, how, how shall I uh, figure out how to say this? Another might be, uh, as people began to say, oh, it's too late, theories aren't really useful for us. Well, I what all I could do was to say, uh, well, just take a look at it. Let's see if it'll help. And I've always said that. Number one, number one, I have to say, my primary purpose is knowledge for nursing. If the Roy adaptation model helps us, that's great. If it doesn't, Fine, that's okay for me too. I'm just glad I could put it out there and see to what extent it was helpful. And I am amazed that it continues to be helpful. So um, yeah, so there are sometimes there's the naysayers and sometimes, but it never stopped the work and it never discouraged me because I said the only thing, I enjoy doing this. So let me develop it and see if it works, you know? But it's also... As nursing has other, you know, we're talking about conceptual-based curricula, we're talking about evidence-based practice, et cetera. Well, I've tried to keep up and show how the model can really help you with some of those ideas. However, uh, if it's not useful, that's okay too. So, uh, and a lot of time, I think another thing is just plain being uh, one human being. I happen to really enjoy what I do, but time is an issue. You know, you can't always uh, give priority. Uh, I like teaching and I want to be pre well prepared for every class. So it's time management, some of those kinds of things too. Yeah. Great. Um, Dr. Zimwalt had a question. Dr. Zimwalt, do you want to, can you talk, I'm not sure if you, you have audio. I don't think oh, you do. Oh, Dr. Yeah, yeah, only you have, only you have audio. Okay. Okay, um, Dr. Zimwalt, just uh, please uh, text your question there in the chat. Um, let's see, moving on to the next question here. Um, okay, um, it looks like as if you were growing your theory at the same time as a few of other greats in our profession at a time before the electronic age that we are in now. I'm curious, did you know what each other were doing? Was there a point of collaboration and discussion with each other? What would you encourage nurse researchers and potential theorists of today to do um, that you may not have been able to do? Well, I would, I think, develop a theory, theory chat room to be able to you know, let people share as they do it. But I did, uh, decide ways uh, uh, the nursing diagnosis movement had just started. And so I proposed to that group that we have a subgroup of nurse theorists. And we were to try to find a, a framework for the nursing diagnoses. But I brought together, and I remember walking to the room, 12 theorists, and I'm including Martha Rogers and Imogen King. And, and I thought, well, just one of two things could happen. This could be really important or the room could blow up from the sheer, sheer energy. Well, the first thing everybody did was say, oh, we don't have to work too hard. Here's my answer, you know? And I said, okay, thank you all very much. But what we're gonna do, and that group worked really hard. You wouldn't believe it. Those women, and one had had a stroke, Rosemary Ellis, and she's propped up, but we had papers all over the boards. And now our product may or may not have been useful, but the process was wonderful for us to know each other and respect each other. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Sorry, the next question is, um, how, did, how did you convince individuals when you first started your theory? Currently in my PhD program, experiencing barriers to new concepts, ideas, what advice would you give to me? I think, uh, great question, because uh, 
And nobody likes new ideas. They like to do it the way they've done it. <laughs> and I think what you have to do is just keep doing your work and then find a way that's maybe useful. In other words, um, uh, you're a doctoral student, but maybe uh, you say, "Can I give, uh, does your unit need a CE? I can just give them and make it very simple about uh, how thinking in nursing fits together with doing, you know? And I think, so I think um, uh, you have to introduce ideas slowly, but most of all, make them useful. So you find the connections and help people see them. Great. And next question is one major hurdle in training new RNs is translating theory into practice, especially when some RNs come from a program that focuses on the biomedical model rather than the nursing model. Do you have any advice on how we can help new nurses translate theory into practice? Yeah, I think uh, there you take a patient focus. You simply say, you're going to take care of this patient today. Uh, you know that the medical diagnosis, but that is not who the patient is. Therefore, let's think about uh, what from your nursing knowledge, you've got it there in the back of your head. And, you, and most nurses use it, they just don't realize they use it, but you pull it out and say what's, you know, uh, you're gonna get their medical needs taken care of pretty quickly, but that's, they're scared to death in the hospital. What do you as a nurse do about that? So I think you have to point out the patient needs from a nursing perspective, because honestly, you can, uh, you know, uh, every nurse, that's what brought them into it. They really want to deal with the whole person, but you have to remind them. And one time I had a panel of our graduates who had been taught the Roy model come back and talk to the new students. And they were saying, well, I, when I first went out, I didn't think, I just wanted to get everything done right. I just wanted to get the meds right. And then all of a sudden I said, what did I do with this great education I had? And then they said, oh, they realized they'd been using it all along, but that they could articulate this just six, a few months, uh, six months or so after graduation. So it's not easy, but but uh, it's, it, it is, going back to being holistic uh, in how you look at the patient. Whoops, I can't hear you. Bill, you're muted. I have to remember to unmute myself, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of nurseology and have studied Chen, Fawcett, Reed, have sought to determine nursing physics, has long sought a unifying, th unifying theory. The ontology of nursing is caring, Reed. Are grand theories still needed? Yeah. Why? Why? Okay, go ahead there. I'll, I'll finish up next. Go ahead. No, no, finish, finish, because I can probably do it all together. Okay. Why is this needed for curriculum? Is middle range theory better to answer nursing questions now that we've established ourselves as a profession in science? Ah, that's a wonderful question. And that it shows that our discipline is moving along. Absolutely. My more recent idea is there should be one goal of nursing, which has to do with humanization. Uh, that paper that was done on the central focus of nursing. And then under that, how do you do that? You can use any one of the theories. The advantage of doing that is there'll be a body of knowledge related to it that will be helpful. And then absolutely, then you use the middle range theories. Uh, and I have some examples of that where I take uh, you know, uh, uncertainty theory and put it with the Roy model, et cetera. So yes, we're really dealing at the middle range level theories and practice level theory. So that person is absolutely right. Uh, but the traditions of the uh, philosophical bases and all the knowledge that's been developed, it, it, it uh, theories are useful in that chain of knowledge, but it's practice level theory that you're using. Thank you. Next question is, um, what is your thought about using your tool to assess RN's knowledge and coping factors regarding the conduct of research? 
Uh, I think any human behavior, every person is an adaptive system. So it definitely can be used at the group level and at the nurse level. And a lot and a number of people have translated it into theories, uh, excuse me, into assessments of nurses. And uh, and in that particular it can be for a particular skill or uh so I would say absolutely yes, because it's very broad and yet has a great deal of detail in it. They'll find what they need in it, particularly if they read some of the chapters in the book that are on the group level, you know, uh, under role, because that's where I would be talking about the nurse being ready to do uh, research. Good, very good question. Okay, great. And another question is, um, what advice would you give students, both undergraduate and graduate, who are preparing to enter nursing today? Oh, I would get, I would say, congratulations. This is a great time to be entering nursing because finally people know what nurses do. Uh, and in a sense, more and more nurses are needed. And uh, so it's the students be very proud of your profession and, uh, you will have a great deal to contribute. And uh, so, but get yourself a buddy group from your class or something and keep it going so that when you're out there, you have somebody to turn to. So whether it's a chat room, you know, once a month or whatever, but have yourself a buddy group because you there will be ups and downs. And, uh, you know, I would say to people when, if you're driving home, especially on the LA freeways and you're thinking, oh my gosh, it was a horrible day. Think of one person you really helped today. You'll find them. Wonderful. So we have a, a, just enough time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, here's one. Um, I believe it is profound for you and groups of educated women to change the way nursing is taught and practiced. What was your experience being a woman in science and healthcare? Did you face backlash in a typically male dominated scientific world? That is very interesting because the first time I went to a woman's college, I taught at a woman's college, I became a postdoc at UCSF. Okay, that was the first time I hit up against the male dominated medical community. However, what helped me is I was funded by Robert Wood Johnson, which they respected. So, but all you can do is be yourself, do your very best. But another play, example, just really quickly, a hospital had implemented the Roy adaptation model and the medical uh, director of the medical staff said, oh, I don't care what you do if it helps. Then they saw him at, in the corner dictating his discharge summary off the nursing notes because <laughs> it was useful. Yeah. So be useful. Great, thank you. Um, I just saw a couple of questions here and we'll finish with these last two questions. Um, how did you select the topic of adaptation to focus on your theory? Was it an organic thought? No, actually, I read, I read something in a book, and I actually found those notes from that summer school class I took at UCLA. I, I just, it was about two pages on adaptation, but I wrote on the side, oh my goodness, this is what nursing is all about. And then in my first class as a master's student in nursing, Dorothy Johnson says, what's the goal of nursing? Well, I'm bold as anything. I said, well, it's to promote patient adaptation. So that was it. But so I got a running start. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Do you think nurses benefit from having more than one middle range theory? For example, Martha Rogers theory and Leiniger's transcultural model. If yes, why? If no, why? Oh, I say what's important is knowledge nursing knowledge for practice. Bar get it from wherever you can. Yeah, mix and match. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. This is an amazing presentation, an amazing evening. Thank you again, Sister Calista Roy. My pleasure. Uh
Before we conclude this, this presentation, I want to mention that Sister Calista Roy has graciously signed and returned three of her third edition Roy adaptation model books that we will keep in the School of Nursing at TU. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, we appreciate you sharing your time with us again this evening. And um, we appreciate you and what you have done for our profession and wish you blessings and everything you do in the future. Um, this concludes our presentation. Thank you all again for joining and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and, and start our second session here. It's about 7.05. Um, so those of you who are remaining on this call, um, I've asked Sister Calista Roy to spend a few minutes um, following your presentation to visit with a few of our faculty, students, and alumni um, who have used her theoretical framework in their personal education and or research. Thank you again for spending a little extra time with us. It may be a little more personal level. Um, to get things started, um, I would like to call on Dr. Angela Martindale to introduce herself and ask the first question. Um, I don't know if we can unmute Angela by chance. Is that possible, James? We cannot unmute uh, um, attendees. Okay, Angela, um, if you will just type um, your question into the, into the box, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. And it looks like we still have um, 20 participants with us right now. Um, so feel free to go ahead and, and type any questions you may have for this session. Um, maybe just some of your experiences with, with her model that we, we can share with her and start and you know, create some conversation. Um, so um, Angela, while Angela's typing that, I just wanted to um, read a couple of the comments that, that you have received during the last presentation. Thank you for sharing your passion and love for nursing. You have, you have warmed um, my spirit. Thank you for taking time to visit with us today. Exclamation point, wow, exclamation point. Um, so I think that's kind of the general sentiment um, among most of our um, attendees today, or if not all of them. Um, let's see. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. A lot of thank yous here um, to panelists and really it just is an amazing experience. And, you know, if I was a student coming to the TU nursing program or in the TU nursing program, what a, I mean, what a, what a thing to remember. I mean, to be able to meet and to visit with um, Sister Calista Roy, um, you know, as far as our, our program being developed around your model. Um, so Angela is still um, typing there. If, does anyone have any questions or comments that you would like um, to share with Sister Calista Roy? Please type those in there. Um, we're down to about 18 participants. I would imagine that's mostly faculty at this time. Okay, um, Dr. Martindale. Um, I'm a great fan of yours and my dissertation theoretical framework involved a self-named grand theory using the adaptation model and I would love to send it to you for review. That's possible. Now the only thing I would ask is that you not hold me <laughs> to a deadline. I would love to respond but it can't always be my top priority. Yes, please do. Yeah. It's easy to find me, yeah. Yeah, and That's I will okay. say, Dr. Martindale was one of the most excited when when I let everybody know that you had accepted an invitation to come speak with us, yeah. um, and um, just a huge fan of yours, and um, so that would be wonderful just yeah, to have. Yeah, it'd be that. nice. It would be good to communicate. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have some other questions or, or comments? Um, <clears throat> okay, here's one right here. This is the year 2020. 
the year of the nurse. What are your thoughts about how nursing has come this far or thus far? Oh, I think um, it's a very uh, exciting time for nursing. Uh, and yes, I think uh, the primarily because of knowledge development, because of it's not it's, it's clinical knowledge, nurses have taken more responsibility in healthcare in general, and oftentimes taking the role of the primary care provider. And uh, it, as well as uh, uh, leadership uh, in clinical roles, as well as uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, academics who are really making major contributions, developing new ways to think about healthcare, uh, such things as uh, uh, the uh, rural care, um, uh, many, many uh, one of my doctoral students did a dissertation on who was doing mental health care in this country. It was a huge percent were in advanced practice mental health nurses. That's where the mental health of the country was coming from. So I think nursing, uh, in the year of the nurse, we can look uh, backwards at an incredible development, but also look forward uh, in that the needs are become greater and more complex, and we need a different kind of a healthcare system in the USA, that's for sure. And nurses need to be part of shaping that. So look backwards and forwards, and it's an exciting time. I see uh, Angela's picture, yeah. Great. <laughs> yes, I believe Ms. Goss has given some uh, some of the participants, participants the ability to um, to be heard. Great, awesome, thank you. Thank you, sister. You're very welcome. Okay, so thank you for speaking with us tonight. After teaching in the TU School of Nursing for 27 years, it is a great honor to hear and speak on your model, to hear you speak on your model. Um, I get stuck with care planning. Sometimes the focal stimulus is the medical diagnosis. In my opinion, the um, FS is what it, it is. Uh, in, your, in, in your text, you, you mentioned sometimes the nurse cannot manipulate the FS and must attend to the, context, attend to the contextual stimuli. Thoughts? Yeah, uh, that may be the case. Uh, in other words, um, the mo uh, well, oh, the, mo the very dramatic one of an amputation. The nurse is not going to be able uh, to create, uh, you know, the person is not going to have the leg back, but how are they going to accept it and learn to walk? And what kind of help do they need? What kind of coping skills do they need? What kind of resources do they need, uh, et cetera? So you're, you're changing the environment, everything about it. And most especially their knowledge, maybe their attitude. Uh, the nurse can do a great deal. And I would say without nursing care, they're, they're just lost. I think it's very much needed, yes. Okay, so it sounds like that um, all um, attendees can be heard now after you unmute. So if you would like to just ask sister a question directly, uh, please feel free to. I do have another question here. It says, thank you for being an agent of true change and following your heart and um, true calling. Your legacy is amazing and truly inspiring. We here at TU take pride in joining you as we carry your, short, your torch. Your legacy shines bright here at TU. Thank you. And, and I think that comment speaks for all of us too. So thank you, thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, would anybody else like to, I think you can unmute and you can talk at this point. While people are, are, are doing that, I, I do have a question for you. You know, yes. just thinking about thinking about COVID nineteen now. Um, you know, wh wh what do you see? I mean, what do you wh where do you see this going? What do you see nurses' role in the fight against COVID nineteen? 
Um, what what should we be doing as a society? What 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 kind of wisdom would you give everyone about COVID nineteen at this point? Well, I think now that we have fairly simple rules, public health rules for controlling it, that nurses can be in the forefront of publicizing those and keeping those in the forefront of people's minds. And now I think nurses have gained through uh, a lot of work during this time because they were on the forefront and treating people and also many sacrificed their lives too. And, uh, but I think uh, the idea would be, uh, you know, they can have uh, pictures, advertisements, uh, you know, the idea of being visible uh, as a nurse, and it doesn't have to be, you know, in a scrub suit, but you there, you don't have to have a stethoscope around your neck. You know, held, I remember uh, 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 Henderson telling me the doctors don't want to wear stethoscopes anymore because nurses are doing that. <laughs> but my point is, uh, there are ways that you project that you're a nurse and that you care about the public health. And therefore, your message is do these simple things. And, uh, and, and, and not to bring blame or, you know, castigations, but protect yourself and protect other people. Prevent it is the main, the main thing, prevent it. What are your thoughts about the idea of Nanda going away? Is this true? Uh, I'm not, oh, well, the last I heard the organization was stronger and stronger in Europe and particularly in Spain. And that's where the headquarters, uh, although the headquarters was still here, uh, but the president at that time was living in Spain. So I'm not really sure what's happening now. And uh, it may be a different kind of organization or a different focus for the organization that's needed. So I'm sorry, I'm not up to date on that. Uh, but I could see where uh, the, the original purpose was to get the typology out and get it used, get nursing language used. Uh, for nursing problems. Uh, and I think it, it, for years, has done some great work related to that, yeah. Would anybody like to speak? I'm not sure if you all can speak right now. I don't, I don't hear anybody chiming in, and I think that I would have heard at this point, so I'm not sure that's still a capability for you. Um, but so go ahead and, and, and type any you know, final questions here. Um, I do have a question for you as the director of the program now at TU. I mean, you know, we, you know, we've used your model extensively in our nursing education of our students. Um, what advice would you give to our school at this point? I mean, if, you know, we want to be, we want to be leaders in nursing education at TU. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, what, what advice would you give us? We're looking for your wisdom here. Okay. Why don't you pick something that you're really good at? Maybe it's the connection to evidence-based practice or something like that. And what you have to do is attach your name to it. Our way of doing this is working really well for us and we wanna share it with you. And first it's on your website and then it becomes an article. And you know, I, I, think, uh, I think pick an area and, and make your own contribution to it. So, so define one or two areas that we're really good at. And yeah, 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 and share it because you, you know, you have, you have a lot of experience. Dr. Zumwalt, can you? Sounds like maybe you can chime in. Yeah, I have a kind of a follow-up question to that, and it may be really kind of poignant. Um, where is the place of nursing theory in nursing school curriculum today? Because um, we have done a lot to establish ourselves as a profession and a science. And I think that is where the grand theory came into. And we have now really focused in on the bedside and the, and, and the middle range theory. So is there still a place in nursing school curriculum for a theoretical base curriculum? And why would that be important uh, moving into the future of nursing education? Uh, let me say two things. I start with that idea of 
nursing knowledge being the important uh, piece of it and a, a common goal, uh, a unified focus on humanization. But then uh, you one school could be particularly good at one approach, uh, either, you know, Roy or Orem or whatever. And if everybody, it just, it, it helps the students to get their minds thinking uh, in one way. But I personally think that they should, like a textbook should start with, this is the overall goal of nursing. Here are the several models and theories whereby we reach our goal. Each one of these has, a, a, has knowledge related to it and then move into the particular approach you want to do. So I, I think that nurses should, nursing education needs to recognize their knowledge base. And knowledge, as I said, is made up of philosophical theory and research. So you can't leave it out. You know, you just can't. Uh, but it can all, and, but it's theory on all levels. It's not just, but, but, you know, don't leave out uh, what the grand theories have contributed. Uh, there was an article in a recent um, I, uh, image, uh, the signal page, about, uh, uh, I think it was um, Kay Avant, oh, no, 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 uh, Lorraine Walker was writing about what those early theories contributed and that are still with us. It was the why they said the wise woman then who then so the idea is uh and so therefore vice versa you can go backwards and say you know uh uh, uh caring you know is a really important concept in nursing and the history of it we've had a number of theorists work on it you know that kind of thing so uh some of the major ideas that we want to explore in a nursing curriculum have bases in some of the early theoretical work. So uh, I, I used to think, I, like I said, I think that the textbook should include this. So whatever, if it's a textbook in med surge, it could say, this is the overall goal of nursing. This is the theoretical approaches and we'll use them as relevant throughout the text. Something like, you know, the idea is don't, don't ignore them because uh, there's too much richness in them for them to be totally ignored. On the other hand, don't twist it and try to make it fit everywhere. It doesn't, you know, that, I, that's not what I'm advocating. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think that's the clarity I was kind of trying to seek because I am very much a nurse theorist myself. Um, you know, uh, Pam Reed was my dissertation director. So I'm very much uh, a nurse theorist at heart. So I, I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. And sister, most of us, I think, are nurse, you know, theorists, and we really have a lot of respect for nursing theory, especially, you know, as we've gone on and gotten higher education in nursing, we understand, really understand the importance of it uh, for nursing. But what would you say to maybe a new undergraduate student who maybe doesn't, you know, likes more hands-on type stuff and says, I don't understand why we have to learn these theories that they, that just, I don't know, just, I don't see myself really getting into this in the future. What would you say to a student like that? Well, you know, I would say, you know what, uh, on a clinical field, I'd say, oh, here, let me help you with your patient this morning, and then we'll sit down afterwards and talk about it. And then, and then I, w I would start asking questions, and they could only be answered by nursing knowledge and theoretical knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make the connections for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, here's a question that just came in. Um, as healthcare and nursing um, world become increasingly more diverse, how can we shift nursing education to not only focus on diverse people and perspectives up front, and also encourage a more diverse demographic to seek advancement and research opportunities in nursing practice? We often touch on diversity, but how can we shift the conversation to be more centered on it? That, that's a really important question. and. Uh, uh, we're fortunate in the USA that we do have wonderful diversity. Uh, we have people who've come from other countries. We have people uh, 
you know, in our own country with uh, very different backgrounds. And uh, I think you have to have a faculty that values it. And then, uh, uh, you know, I had a friend on the East Coast when I told them that my school had something like 68% non-white uh, students. Uh, and they said, how do you do that recruitment? I said, no, it's the population. <laughs> I live in Southern California. And my nieces and nephews are named Morales, Rodriguez, Avila, come on, you know. <laughs> but, but the thing is, uh, so you have to take your local situation into account, but people have to know that they're welcome. You know, and, and I always say, try to recruit in pairs. You know, don't bring in one black person into a class. Try to, you know, the founder of our nursing department 70 years ago, the first class was five people. A black, she got the brightest black woman she knew. She got the, his, she had Hispanic, Asian, white. I mean, it was just incredible. Five people. And she had this. And the second class, the same thing. I wish she just, but from day one, it was built into the value system of the department and it has never left here. And however, as I say, we've been fortunate that we have a great pool to draw from, but uh, yeah. Great. But I think it's having the faculty really believing in diversity. And, and all kinds of diversity, yeah. Definitely. Okay, do we have any final questions here? Okay, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna get off this this call. We're all gonna think we should ask whatever, right? <laughs> but, but we didn't. So um, we really appreciate you again. We appreciate everything you've done for nursing. You've been just an inspiration to all of us. You continue to be an inspiration to us um, in your life and what you've done. Um, and we want to just thank you, thank you, thank you again for taking time to meet with us. And um, yeah, it's been a real privilege. It has. I've enjoyed my time with you. And thank you for setting it up and making it easy. All thank right. you. Have a, have a great have a great night, everyone. You too. Thank you very much.